Hi, good evening. I think we should be streaming. Just hello, Philip. Welcome from su sunny southern Spain. Awesome stuff. I was in Barcelona last week. Um, yeah, Sandro, welcome. Good to see you, Lloyd and the Lloyd Debts. Okay, so I have a connection according to OBS. So welcome all. Thanks all for being here. Um, I've said hello to everyone from uh, Servant of the Lord Kyrios. Thank you for joining up with the members, Dr. Obvious, Shadow611, Roseanne, Cassandra, Neil, Gen Z. Welcome. <clears throat> okay, guys, let's let's dive in. I've got 29 slides because since the last episode, I decided to add a few more slides. I was done, but then I added like 10 more. And... Um, yeah, I thought I thought that'd be useful, and then I've been working on some other things. Um, basically, part two of the um, of Pius X's discussion on modernism, and of course the corruption of philosophy, and of course we're going to be talking about people like David Hume, Immanuel Kant, um, and uh, Descartes, and we'll touch on some others, but we want to talk about the utter irrationality of their ideas. And we want to bolster the, the simple fact that these are all a reaction to and an assault on Christian values. They are a reaction to and an assault on Christian logic, Christian ideas of the world, the Christian worldview, which is rational. So now I spoke with someone today who said, well, you know, some of the modern stuff doesn't interest me. This is all related to Christianity. All of this is an attack, an assault, an undermining of the scholastic theology that or the method of finding truth that was so important in the development of the modern world in the west in science and this was a catholic thing this was most definitely historically not protestant so this is something to bear in mind it's all an attack on the catholic church because the catholic church had something that to my mind to my investigation according to the history is true is correct and it establishes a worldview that these philosophers are rejecting they're fighting against it. They're trying to destroy the church because they do not want the a biblical worldview. They don't want a, a godly worldview. Understand? So they're introducing this chaos. All of these things, like when you look at communism, socialism, when you look at fascism, any of these ideologies, all of them also, they pretend to be rational. Even atheism, they pretend to be rational. They pretend to be based on logic and coherence and so on and so on. None of them are. All of them are mystical all of them are just plain mysticism and the worst kind of pagan mysticism so that said and we'll be discussing martin luther very soon um uh, yes they are undermining critical thinking shadow 611 that is very very true and critical thinking as we know it as we understand it there's the trivium and the quadrivium that, that is again another catholic innovation um and uh yeah we we <clears throat> so i will be discussing martin luther i'll be discussing um bad protestants there were plenty of those and protestantism protestantism is founded on a series of bad ideas then you've also got bad catholics bad catholics inside the church who also have worked to undermine and destroy the church and we'll start looking at some of those things and um yeah but let's do you watch internet christian debates to be honest debates bore me to tears I have tried watching some of them. There have been one or two that have been okay, Muslim debates, but I, no, it, it doesn't interest me really. I, I, I can't, I just can't. The The only guy that I've seen do some really good debates is um, is a British guy, um, older professor of mathematics, really funny. Um, can't remember his name or fan, but but he's, his replies, his responses are fantastic. Really like that. Although I've also watched some William Lane Craig. He's got some great stuff as well. Okay, let's dive in. So, okay, this is the last slide we had. We spoke of the Neoplatonic school of Alexandria under Plotinus, right? And this was an original syncretism of the previous philosophies on the basis of mysticism. So Pius X speaks of the synth synthesis of all heresies. Now, this is simply an old idea repackaged for the modern era. So let's continue. <clears throat> ah, before I do that, let me dive into something here. Critical thinking is a term coined by a socialist named John Dewey. However, critical thinking is still good thinking, whereas critical theory, you know, in terms of critical thinking, that I'm not, I'm not sure if John Dewey developed that, but what you have is critical thinking, which means critical as in criticism, 
to destroy, to undermine, to criticize, to constantly criticize. I've discussed that in my discussions on socialism, and I don't think it was by John Dewey. Um, that, that's simply a repurposing of the term, of the idea of thinking critically. But they use it in the terms of, of criticizing, undermining, destroying. Uh, so yeah, there, there's... Okay, I want to talk briefly about this. Um, because at some point I will have to talk about the uh, the black legend, right? The um, Spanish Inquisition. We're going to have to discuss that. And there are numerous attacks on the church, numerous things that come up. And the main thrust of supposedly Martin Luther's argument is on indulgences, the abuse of ind indulgences in the Catholic Church. Well, we happen to have indulgences in the Protestant Church cranked up to not just 11, cranked up to 1,000. It is far, far worse than anything ever historically. And of course, because the Catholic Church is one big target, it's one, it actually has a chief on top, a guy, a boss on top who makes decisions where the buck stops. Everyone can blame the Catholics. But when you've got 90 billion different non-Catholic, shall we say, Protestant denominations, when one group of Protestants believe in drinking blood, slaughtering babies, torturing kittens, and, and, and I don't know, having sex with prostitutes on the altar, the other Protestants can go, well, you know, sure, they're Protestants, but they're not our Protestants and nothing to do with us. Well, it's under the same umbrella. It's under your umbrella. So, but let's have a look. So, but because now this gives them, of course, an immediate out. Well, it's, we're the 92nd church of 23rd Avenue in Pennsylvania. And, and the guys who are having sex on the altar, those are the, that's the 43rd church. Um, you know, so it's got nothing to do with us. You know, that's okay. So, well, yeah, how do you fix problems under your roof? How do you fix problems? Um, so you can't, you don't, and that's the problem. So this is indulgences for the Protestant church. It's called the prosperity gospel. Let's just have a look at a few headlines here. The abuse of authority in prosperity gospel churches. Prosperity gospel churches are seedbeds for abuse of authority. In what ways is the prosperity gospel wrong or harmful? It promotes greed and self-advancement. Okay, the cruelties of the prosperity gospel, a very modern heresy. Have we overreacted against the prosperity gospel? It assumes that we're supposed to have heaven on earth. It's This is basically witchcraft for Protestants. You pay the witch a little bit of money and they give you good luck, right? You used to pay witches for good luck. Well, this is the same thing. You're just paying it to the priest. Yeah, the no true Protestant fallacy. Yeah. The prots are not agreeing with us or not prots. Exactly. So who's right? Who's right? You? Yeah, exactly. What authority do you have except your personal private opinion? What is the difference between opinion and doctrine in the Protestant church? Well, there isn't one. It's just opinion. It's all opinion. The magic wish machine. Exactly. This is a corruption of Christianity. And this is something that is prevalent in the Protestant church. My question is, what are you going to do about it? Now, I do realize my, my content is contentious. It, it upsets certain people, but fine, that's just the way it is. Why are people attracted to the prosperity gospel? This fake gospel is, is that they do not want to teach them the truth. Five reasons I hate the prosperity gospel. It's one of the most hateful and abusive things happening in the church world today. And the, they use the Bible as a tool for unbiblical things. Okay, they, the, the teachers of the prosperity gospel may quote God's word, but they twist it to support a theology of greed, deceit, and exploitation. Because tell me something, during the Middle Ages, how many planes, how many Jaguars, how many Rolls Royces were these priests buying? How many of them were getting away with this? This is a serious problem today in this church. Prosperity theology, abusing the faith of their listeners by enriching themselves through large donations. It is fundamentally flawed at bottom. It is a, it is a false gospel. The prosperity gospel movement exploits the poor. The, the prosperity gospel's unbiblical view of money abuses vulnerable people. So it ignores and contradicts many passages in the Bible. So why people fall for the prosperity gospel? And so it would seem there is a problem here. Okay. So yeah, no true Protestant is doing this, I guess. But yeah, what are you going to do about it? Because the Catholic Church was dealing with the issue of indulgences before Martin Luther made it a pretext for his claims. So... Yeah, let's let's hear let's see for a fact what you guys are doing about it. 
So can I please talk to you one of these days, Lloyd? I don't think you realize how much this ideology you discovered has invaded education. I know. I've done talks on socialism and exactly how they invaded the American education system, how they wrote the textbooks. I've discussed this in depth on my discussions on, on socialism. Um, just drop me an email. Look up my email address. Go to my About page. I change the email address every so often, so don't use the same one all the time. Check it. Send me an email. I speak with a lot of people. You'd be surprised how many people on the channel I actually talk to. Welcome, Dr. Jonathan Gimmel. I've spoken about John Dewey on my talks on on socialism and atheism already. I've already done that. So, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I've already spoken about all of this stuff. Very early in New Zealand, I don't doubt. Yeah. Okay, so let's have a talk about this topic. Protestant mystics. Now, there are such a thing as Protestant mystics. And although this is not very well known. Right, and these Protestant mystics are Gnostic heretics. There is no doubt in my mind about that. So there is such a thing as Protestant mysticism, and this emphasized the personal experience of God and direct communion with God, which is no different to what the Sufis believe. Right. So you had a guy called Sebastian Frank, 1499 to 1542. He was a German. These Germans oh, keeps coming up. He was a German Protestant mystic. He believed in the idea of universal salvation. And he rejected the Trinity because, because that's what Protestants do. He was not a true Protestant, obviously. He was influenced by radical reforms, including Thomas Minter, and he was considered a heretic by mainstream Protestant authorities. This doesn't mean he wasn't influential or didn't get the idea from other Protestants. Valentine Weiler, 1533-1587, German mystic and theologian who believed in the idea of inner illumination. I've discussed this concept of inner illumination and imminence uh, which is part and parcel of Luther, Calvin, uh, the Mormons, and a whole bunch of heretical groups, including the um, the guys who went to the, uh, America. I can't remember the, um, uh, gosh, you know, there's the, the the Puritans, right? All of them had these ideas of inner illumination, which is Gnosticism. And they believed in direct revelation from God. It's like, oh, God talks to me directly. I don't need to go through a church, don't need a priest. God God works for me. You see, God, God I'm special and God talks to me personally. I am that special. So he rejected church authority. He discussed individual spiritual experience. And this is called mysticism. And this is also very Gnostic. It is private revelation. Christianity is based on public revelation. So he was influenced by the teachings of the quote-unquote Christian Gnostic tradition. So virtually all of Protestantism is premised on being able to be a Christian, but also fornicate, total depravity, prosperity. Once saved, always saved. Yeah, it, or, yeah, well, it covers for sin, yeah. So, inner illumination, yeah. How do I fight it? What do I have to do to make more people see? Well, look, we can only speak the truth. You know, you become a grain of sand, right? That grain of sand eventually starts an avalanche of sand. And so you, you become a grain of sand in the gears. You speak up. Your voice is powerful. It destroys their narrative. They Do not let them shut you up. That's the whole point of censorship is to shut you up. <coughs> so, anyway, moving on. Then you had a guy called Jacob Burma. He was alive from the late 1500s to the 1600s, German Christian mystic and philosopher who wrote extensively on spiritual matters. So his works such as the Aurora and the Signature of All Things were highly influential in the development of Protestant mysticism. For instance, he described God as a mysterious and incomprehensible force that contained both light and darkness, good and evil. In other words, God was Satan too. God was evil too. Now, this is what we call Manichaeism. This is Gnosticism. These are Protestants. These are Protestant mystics. Welcome to the heretics. All right. So now these ideas of these Protestant mystics intersected with Gnostic beliefs. And this obviously led to a subversion of mainstream Protestant theology. That is not God exactly by sight. That is Protestant theology. <clears throat> now, Jacob Burma, and he created a, a movement called Bermanism or Bermanism. Right. So he deviated from Christian doctrine in multiple ways. On the nature of God. God is mysterious and incomprehensible, like Allah. Islam is dualistic too, but yeah, it, it, Islam is hermetic, Islam is a lot of things. So basically, God is mysterious and incomprehensible, like Allah, and God contains both light and darkness, good and evil. This contradicts the Christian view of a purely good, transcendent God. The fall and redemption. His idea of the fall of humanity and the process of redemption was different to Christian teaching. So he said the fall was necessary for human spiritual growth. It wasn't the fall. This was a chance for you to do better. 
and that redemption involved a process of inner transformation and spiritual enlightenment rather than accepting salvation. We could do this ourselves. We, we, can, we can free ourselves through having better knowledge. It's basically Gnostic and rejects Jesus' salvation. The role of the church. He questions the, he questions the authority of the institutional church. He emphasizes the importance of personal revelation, private revelation, the voices in my head, and personal subjective spiritual insight. He said individuals can have direct communion with God. See, I have a direct line. I, I've got Jesus on speed dial. And you didn't need the church or any clergy. You could make up your theology as you go. And he spoke of the unity of creation. So he said that all of creation, including the physical world, was interconnected. This is pantheism. It's paganism. And all of the world reflected the divine essence. So this is a pantheistic view, and it challenges the dualistic separation between the material and spiritual realms that is found in traditional Christian theology. Right. So his ideas challenged and expanded the boundaries of Christian doctrine. Right. So he was speaking of personal, personal spiritual experience, just knowing because can feel it. I can feel the burning in my bosom. Jesus is talking to me right now. And Jesus says, I need to go edit the Bible because there's, if I edit it, I'll make it better. That's exactly what Martin Luther felt. That's exactly what Calvin said. They based it on personal inner healing. Yes, the mystical sophists are the worst. Yeah. Have you ever covered opposing voices to these beliefs on ideas like Frederick Bastiat and Ludwig von Mises? No, no, I have not. I didn't do economic theory on the channel. I'm sorry, but so, okay, <clears throat> so, right, now, next thing. So we go from Protestantism, pro sorry, I really can't speak today, I've been exhausted the last two weeks. So we go from Protestantism to Marx via Hegel, and I've got a link here that I'm bringing up. Ah, that's Jacob Burma. Okay, so let's ignore him for the moment. So Burma influenced Christian mystical movements and anti-authoritarian groups. So these are people who are anti-authoritarian, but also anti the Catholic Church, obviously. The point is to establish a new theology that is anti-Catholic, anti-authority, anti the Church. Okay, Bastet, you're a distraction. Just stop right now. Stop. Stay on point. Okay, if you want to talk about ice cream, fast cars, and um, financial theory, just leave that for another day. Okay? So his ideas on sin, evil, and redemption aligned with Lutheran theology. Humanity's fall from divine grace and the restoration of the world to a state of grace by God. So, okay, so Luther was influenced by this guy or they had a certain alignment in their theologies. Now, you can see this man is anti-Christian, right? The man is not, he's anti-Christian, he's Gnostic. In fact, he's somewhat Manichaean, but apparently he's, according to the source here, let me just go back to the source, but according to the source here, he and Luther have a lot in common. That's New World Encyclopedia. Yep, so that's New World Encyclopedia. So his ideas align with Martin Luther, but the man is anti-Christian. Well, that's odd, because that would mean that Luther has ideas that are somewhat anti-Christian. His writings influenced later philosophers like Hegel. Hegel is the guy that created a fool called Karl Marx. Okay, Hegel, one day we will talk about Hegel. Hegel was just, how can I phrase this? Hegel was batshit insane. Okay, okay, Bastet, stop, stop, okay? So, look, Bastet, I'm not having a private conversation with you. There are multiple other people as well. I'm having a particular discussion on a given topic that I've prepared. Okay, so I'm not here to talk about other things. You're a distraction right now. So stop. Okay. Now, his writings influenced Hegel. So this Christian Protestant mystic influenced Hegel, who produced some of the worst philosophy and the worst theology that has caused massive amounts of death and destruction in the world. This man inspired Martin Luther. All right. And of course, now we will talk about Hegel. I'm actually going to, I will discuss Hegel in the future. He also influenced Schelling and Nietzsche. Nietzsche was, was an arch atheist who was, uh, who was, shall we say, someone that was highly respected by a guy called Adolf Hitler. So, so, so Marx's favorite instructor and, and, and Hitler's favorite atheist, you know, was, were influenced by this Christian mystic, this Protestant. So Protestantism has a few things to answer for here. Okay. So 
So he taught individual religious experience over strict adherence to scripture. Oh, we, we're not, I don't need the, no, 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 no. You see, Jesus speaks to me and therefore I know exactly what the Bible means. It's not what the Bible says. You see, we don't have to strictly adhere to scripture because, because, you know, I, I bypassed the priest and I bypassed the church and I don't even need the Bible because Jesus talks right into my ear. So he believed in this conflict between divine wrath and divine love. So he developed the theory of creation based on a dialectic within God. Dialectic, of course, Hegel was famous for his dialectic and Marx, of course, took that idea of the dialectic. Now, dialectic has different meanings, but um, yeah, so let's, the, yeah, there's a, the communists use it a little differently to the way we would, and I've discussed it in the past, but Basically, this is a struggle between divine wrath and divine love. So God is fighting within himself because God is both good and evil. God is Satan and God is God, which is not Christian by any means. And he said this was necessary for the creation of the universe. How? I don't know and I don't particularly care, but this is not a Christian idea from this <clears throat> Christian mystic, Protestant. So he rejected the sacrificial atonement for human sins. He taught this was an, that the atonement was just an expression of God's love for humanity and a symbol. It's just a symbol. It just it just was them showing. You know, I, you know, it, it wasn't real. There wasn't anything physical. It's kind of it's just a symbol of how to achieve spiritual perfection. Jesus was just an example. And if you just do what Jesus did, you too will become spiritually perfect. So he took the, sh the focus away from sin and salvation. Okay. Um, give me a second. Okay, but state, look, enough, okay? Fine, enough. So guys, let's focus on the topic, please. I, I'm, but state, I've put you in timeout for 30 minutes. You can come back later. I don't care what the discussion is about anymore. You are off topic. Let us please stick to the topic, okay? So now, he takes the focus of sin and salvation through Christ's sacrifice, and he says, you know, we can imitate Christ, and by being like Christ, we're just a hippie skipping through the valleys, saying nice things. If we do these things, we too can become perfect. We can become a, a perfect spiritual being, you know, because we can adopt the Christ nature too. Uh, how Christian does that sound to you? Well, it's not. So now, so he deviates from Christian beliefs on atonement, sin, and salvation. So he undermines the redemptive sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins, right? And of course, he then questions Christ's mission on earth. He says, no, this wasn't about salvation, and we can only achieve salvation because Christ died for our sins. It's like, no, he came to be an example for us. Just be like him, and you too can be a perfect spiritual being. You can also be like God. So he believed that Christ's mission was to guide individuals towards spiritual enlightenment. You see, he was the perfected man, just like Muhammad is the Insan al Kamal, the perfected man. Just like you have the perfected socialist man and woman, just like you have the Ubermensch. You have the superior man of Nietzsche. You have, you know, so they were just teachers of enlightenment and unity with the divine. So you can you can achieve perfection yourself just following these people. Right? That's his idea. So now philosophy, we have to just make a difference. Sounds a little bit like Islam. Yeah, follow Muhammad. So now philosophy versus theology. So let's make a distinction here. Philosophy is critical inquiry into fundamental questions about the nature of existence, knowledge, values, reason, mind, and language. It is based on reason, evidence, and logic, and it wants to understand the world through systematic analysis and argumentation. Theology, however, is the study of the nature of divinity, of religious beliefs, and the practice of religion. Now, within the Catholic understanding, the two go together. They are not separate. They are complementary. It doesn't mean that philosophy is superior because there are things that are, we would say, beyond human understanding. These are these are Christian mysteries. So we accept those. But this doesn't mean that, that we should have not attempt to understand or that they are completely irrational and illogical when you accept them. So theology involves exploring questions about the existence and nature of God, the relationship between humanity and the divine, and the meaning and purpose of life based on religious doctrines and texts. So philosophy and theology both engage in inquiry and reflection on fundamental questions, but they differ in methodologies, assumptions, and goals. Yes, faith and reason together, exactly century since. Reason, evidence, logic, the trinity of philosophy. Yes. Now, the next series of talks that I'm going to give, we're going to discuss how 
the Enlightenment philosophers like Kant, Hume, and Descartes, for instance, rejected the concept of evidence, right? They reject evidence. They actually reject the concept of logic. They reject cause and effect. So we'll discuss that. So this is, it, these people are just insane. There, there's nothing. What you'll find is when you start to look at the, the errors, the foolishness, the philosophy, the philosophy of Enlightenment philosophers, you start to learn that these people were preaching ideas that we used to put people in rubber rooms for in the last century. So now philosophy emphasizes reason and empirical evidence. So therefore, these philosophies of these modernists are not philosophies. They are errors because they reject evidence. Now they use the words, okay? It's like the song Julia says by Wet, 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 you know, I can hear the words, but I don't feel the love. Well, they use the words, but they don't mean it like we do. And they don't. Yeah. So we'll discuss. So while theology includes faith, revelation, and religious tradition, these are three different things, right? So philosophy tends to have a more universal scope and is not bound by specific religious beliefs. Theology is rooted in often specific religious traditions and teachings. So let's go to St. Augustine and Pseudo Dionysus. St. Augustine teaches us that we know the essence of things in what he calls rationibus eternus. But this knowledge has its starting point in the data of sense. Okay, so we know things in eternity. We know things in eternity, things that are eternal. But we know them through sensory data. In other words, our experience of the world, we see things and we make rational connections. We make logical connections between things, cause and effect and other things. Yeah, so-called Enlightenment philosophers. Dr. Gemmel, when we go through the Enlightenment philosophers, when I talk about Kant and Hume and, and Descartes, you're going to see that these people are just, they're idiots. I, I, for my whole life, I was taught you know, we revere these men for their great thinking. These are some of the greatest think. These people are idiots. They are, they are fools. They're dummies. Honestly, they, they should not be respected. They should be laughed at. That is my conclusion. As a non-PhD, as someone who dropped out of university, who talks on YouTube, having looked at the writings of... Now they'll say, well, you know, they, they said over here once that one plus one is equal to two. Look how amazingly smart they are. Yeah, sure, they said that. They also said some really dumb, obviously stupid, laughable things that you never hear about. So what I'm going to do is basically present those stupid things, those things they cover up, the things they forgot to tell you, the irrational, laughable, utterly insane ideas these people have. So this is important. This is really important to know the sentence that I have here. Okay. We know because of what we perceive. We perceive the world and we understand. We process that data, right? We also see objective reality. Now, this term is used in philosophical and theological contexts, right? To refer to the idea of eternal laws, eternal reasons, eternal principles, or eternal truths that govern the universe. Pseudo Dionysius, okay, in his works gave a systematic treatment of Christian mysticism. He distinguished between rational knowledge and mystical knowledge. But the former, rational knowledge, he says, we know God. Okay, so by the former, by rational knowledge, we know God, not in God's nature, but through the wonderful order of the universe, which is a participation of the divine ideas. So we participate in the universe. We are part of the universe. That's the Christian idea. We are present in an objective world, right? We are present in God's universe. And this world that God made has traces of his character. It's because he made it, therefore it is made in his image, in his nature, as we are. And we participate in it. We perceive it. We understand it. We recognize things. Now, we're going to see that the Enlightenment philosophers go and they completely turn this backwards and upside down. So we have to understand the Christian view and then they'll see how they completely flip this idea on its head. So now, okay, so we know the world. We participate in the world. There is, Avea, he adds, a more perfect knowledge of God possible in this life beyond the attainments of reason, even reason enlightened by faith, through which the soul contemplates directly the mysteries of divine light. Now, that, of course, is mysticism. And he says this contemplation in the present life is possible only to a very few privileged souls, through a very special grace given by God. Okay, it is the theosis or mystic enosis. So very few people can become saints who are given this illumination by God as a grace. Of course, now the words, the works of Pseudo Dionysius exercised a great influence on the following ages. So this is sort of an encapsulation or summary of Christian 
mysticism. So now let's look at John Scotus Erugena. Okay, this is his book here. John Scotus Erugena, also known as John the Scot, was an Irish philosopher, theologian, and poet in the 9th century. He's known for his work, Periphyseon, or Division Naturae, Naturae, whatever, The Divisions of Nature, in which he attempted to reconcile Christian theology with Neoplatonic philosophy. Neoplatonic philosophy is, is what you have before you flush the toilet. So I'd say he's slightly missing the mark here by trying to mix Christian theology with, with heretical ideas. So, Erigena's writings were influential in the development of scholastic thought in the Middle Ages. He was controversial due to unorthodox views, but he was still seen, unfortunately, as are many, like even William of Ockham, as important thinkers, when these people were just generally idiots. His book was influenced by eternal principles, but he did not follow Dionysius' distinctions between philosophy and theology, or God and creatures, and that's important, the distinction between God and the creature. Because from the mystical point of view, so from a Christian point of view, you're a human, your intellect is limited. You can see God through reason. You can at least no. You can know that there is a God through reason. You can see nature. You can see with cause and effect. You can understand that God made the world. There is a God based on what you see, and you can make connections. You can make calculations and determine. Look, I think there's a God, right? Based on evidence. However, the mystics take it a little differently. And then Christian mysticism, you are aided by God. You are given a grace where you you commune with God. But you understand you are the creature and God has given you the grace to, to feel him or sense him. But the mystics that we're talking about, they believe that they merge with God. And therefore, technically they are God and they're just going back home. They are merging as God with God. This is pantheism, right? Because they, because then if they are the creature and they can merge with God, then God is also a creature. They can merge with him. So then God is demoted and they are promoted and then they become God. That is a complete difference. They, and this is what the Sufis believe. That's what Muslims believe. This is not what Christians believe. So he embraced pantheistic ideas similar to those of Plotinus instead. So by embracing heretical pagan ideas, he then, eomysticism. Yeah, that's something to talk about as well in the future. Okay. Now, in the 12th century, Orthodox mysticism was further developed by the Victorian theologians Hugh, Walter, and Richard in a systematic manner. There was a revival of Erugena's principles by thinkers such as Amori de Bene, Joachim de Flores, and David of Denant. Okay, mysticism. Now, a legitimate element of mysticism is emphasized, okay, is found in the works of the schoolmen, the scholastics of the 13th century. Apparently so. So apparently there's some element of mysticism within Thomas Aquinas, as an example. But Thomas Aquinas was very much connected to facts, logic, reality, and objectivity. Anselm, before Aquinas had a huge fight in his hands, apparently with Catholic mystics who were just completely disconnected from reality. And we'll see how that disconnection from reality plays out in the Enlightenment. Okay. So in the 14th and 15th centuries, there was a protest against apparently what they called a sterile dialecticism, a sterile intellectualism. Okay, And therefore there was a revival. This is during the time of the Renaissance. This is like from the Renaissance and after the Renaissance and a revival of mystical systems. When they say mystical, they mean Gnostic, heretical, and occult, right? And when they say there's a process against sterile dialecticism, what they mean is that scholasticism as the, or the scholastic method was, <clears throat> was destroying the irrational nonsense that was the heretical pagan Gnostic systems. It was finally determining truth, and they were, because of this, eradicating the irrationality that was the Gnostics, right? And so therefore, this is the pretext they have. Well, you know, it's all become very sterile. It's just too much in your head, as opposed to they are showing us to be false. They're showing us to be wrong. That's what it is. So when you read the one thing, you need to understand they're writing it in a way that is propagandistic. So you're talking about the Sufis becoming God. Thank you. They're, yeah, the Sufis merge with God. The Sufis, they, they utilize these... Um, these post-rational and pre-rational states. In other words, they leave the rational mind, they do these rituals, and they, they merge through the 99 veils, and they eventually pierce the final veil, and they enter into the throne room of God, and they merge with God. They become like God. So this is something the Sufis do, right? So they become perfected. Muhammad was perfected. He was the perfect man, and therefore they can as well. So voluntary possession. Yeah, well, that's Maxima. Your description of merging with God reminds me of voluntary possession. You know, that's a really interesting point. I did not think of that, but that's, that is that is very thought-provoking. 
That's a really good point. That's actually a, that's a really, really, really good theological point. Excellent, excellent catch there. So some orthodox, okay. So there was a revival of mystical systems. There were some orthodox mystical systems by Reisbrook, Gerson, Peter de Ailey, and Dennis the Carthusian. And then you had heterodox or, you know, John of Ghent, John of Maracourt, the Beguines, and the Begards. So, and various brotherhoods were influenced by Averroism. I'm not going to go into detail, but he's a Muslim. So you're talking about various groups, supposedly Christian, that were influenced by this Muslim. Right? Then you've got Meister Eckhart. I've mentioned him before, right? Who in his opus, Tripartitum, teaches a deification of man. So Meister Eckhart, remember, who was, and we'd spoken about, um, so yeah, we'd spoken of Meister Eckhart in the previous show. So he goes on to teach a deification of man, an assimilation of the creature into the creator through contemplation. Hold on, we just saw that in the Christian Protestant mystic. So you merge, you merge with God. Okay, so God is, you. either you are divine that you can merge with God, or God is not divine. God is a creature, God is pantheistic, and you can thus merge with him. So, and this is, um, so yeah, so now, now you've got Meister Eckhart, who is clearly a heretic. Okay, and he was defended by a good Catholic. Okay. And again, the Catholic Church defends, uh, we'll, we'll come back to we'll come back to him. We can't remember his name now offhand, um, but yeah, we'll, we'll get back to all of this. <coughs> Diane Alices, seems as though you're doing a much better job describing Catholic thought and theology than many Catholics do. Thanks. I, I'm reading a lot of Catholic material. It's, it's dense, uh, honestly. But yeah, I'm trying to simplify. Yes, Aquinas was a realist mostly, that's true. So now in the Theologia Germanica, and to a certain extent, German philosopher Nicholas of Cusa, who sadly, German philosopher Nicholas of Cusa was Catholic. Okay, so what you found is you had a revival of mystical systems in the Theologia, Theologia Germanica, which influenced Martin Luther heavily. Okay, that book I've mentioned has a heavily influence on Martin Luther, but also you had German philosopher Nicholas of Cusa, who happened to be a Catholic priest, right? And he then came up with a theory of coincidentia oppositorum, opposites, coincidences, whatever. So let's talk about that. Now, then we also, I have spoken in the past of Heraclitus paganism. And so Heracli Her or Heraclitus or Heraclitus, however you want to pronounce that. Heraclitus is a pagan. The man's irrational. The man's laughably stupid. Um, I've discussed him in the past extensively in other videos. But um, this man is a pagan who believes in constant change and opposites. He's, you know, like, like men are women, women are men, and wet is dry and hot is cold and up is down and hard is soft and... And everything is changing and everything is, and therefore you can't know anything because it changes and you're not the same because you you don't actually exist because you're constantly changing. And who you were at five is not who you were at 20. You're, you're a totally different person. So therefore there's constant movement and nothing is, nothing is knowable. Nothing is definable. Everything is different and whatever. The guy was incoherent. But anyway, so Nicholas of Cusa died in 1464, German philosopher, theologian, and mathematician, known for his concept of the coincidentia oppositorum. This translates to the eight coincidence of opposites. So this idea suggests that supposedly contradictory or opposing elements can be reconciled or united in a higher unity. In other words, good and evil can be united in a higher unity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Satan and God can be united. Sure, sure, buddy. Okay. So you can have a synthesis. Now, hold on. Didn't Marx and Hegel talk about synthesis? You know, dialectics and synthesis. Yeah, I guess they did. So in other words, he believed that contradictions can coexist and complement each other in a harmonious whole. Now, man and woman complement each other, but they are not contradictions. Okay. Whereas poison and water might mix, it's not a good mix. All right. So this concept had a significant influence on metaphysical and philosophical thought in relation to the understanding of reality and the resolution of paradoxes. Right. So the, the harmony of opposites, as expressed by Nicholas of Cusa, is similar to the ancient pagan Greek philosophy like that of Heraclit, Heraclitus or Heraclitus. So Heraclitus, he was a pre-Socratic philosopher from ancient Greece, and he spoke of the unity of opposites. So he believed that change and conflict are fundamental to the nature of reality. So he saw opposition and contradiction as essential components of a harmonious and dynamic equilibrium in the universe. In other words, um, things that don't mix, things that are contradictory are supposedly somehow friends. This idea is what we found in Marxism, and Marx got it from Hegel, and Hegel was nuts. So this is now something that is being taught by a Catholic theologian, and this is also something being taught by a mystic, and this is also something taught by Protestant mystics. I have an Eckhart book, so good to know. We'll keep for reference, like Plotinus, the Quran, Rumi. Okay. 
Great. So check out the Sufi Dikr, for example, of this. Yeah, the world be much if Gnostics didn't learn to type. Yeah. So let's go on. So the concept of the harmony of opposites has reappeared throughout history and has been interpreted in multiple different ways, right? So the specific ideas and the cultural context will differ, but the theme of reconciling opposites and finding unity in diversity is a recurring motif in philosophical thought. It's also very, very pagan. So now Heraclitus and doublethink, okay? And this is also very Darwinian because Heraclitus also influenced a man called Darwin. So Heraclitus, 6th century BC, pre-Socratic philosopher. So he believes in the unity of opposites. So he states that contraries are the same. He also said you cannot step in the same river twice. Now the river is still the same river. You cannot step in the same water twice because the water is flowing, but you, you are stepping in the same river. The name is the same. But it's, he says, no, it's a different river. So he's simply just misinterpreting, misrepresenting the fact. But he says countries are the same. In other words, good and evil are the same. Okay, um, let's say lawful, moral, post-marital sex is the same as pedophilia. You see, because they, they are contrary, but they're the same because they are complementary. They're actually two halves of the same whole. Understand the moral issues at stake here. And he says opposites are identical. Opposites are identical. That's why a chick with a wee-wee is the same as one without one, as, as, as a woman who owns a vagina. Okay, so so according to him, all things in the world are in a constant state of, state of flux and change driven by tension and interaction between opposites. So opposites are good. So what you need to do is you need to throw the opposites at things and this will just was balance things out, bring balance to the force. So we need more criminals in New York City because we don't have enough crime because opposites balance out the lack of crime we 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 can't have just a lack of crime because no 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 we, we need to have the opposite so he argued that opposites are not separate or distinct entity, entities but interconnected they are dependent they are part of a larger whole they are the same opposites are the same that's why men can be women for example day and night hot and cold life and death and good and evil are not separate but different manifestations of the same thing they yeah so you see, if things are the same, then they cannot be different. You can't make distinctions. So they're trying to destroy distinctions. They're trying to destroy the ability to define differences. He believed that everything is in a constant state of transformation, and this transformation is possible because opposites exist within each other. That's a corruption of the idea of the Tao, for that matter. But he said war is the father of all and the king of all. War renders some gods. He makes others men. He makes some slaves and others free. Marx, sorry, Darwin took this idea, war is the father of all, okay? War creates gods. And Darwin took this idea, and this is the survival of the fittest. Yeah, Dr. Jonathan Gemmel, I have discussed Heraclitus in other talks on Darwin. I've discussed him on Darwin. Um, the guy was just, he lost his marbles. The man was irrational. I, I know people go like, oh, he's amazing. Read his stuff. The man is nuts. Honestly, it's, it's hard to explain, but the guy was an idiot. The guy was clearly just utterly irrational we would today or rather put this in, like in a slightly different time we would have put him in a rubber room in a straight jacket very simple and he says couples are holes and they are not holes and what agrees disagrees the concordant is discordant and from all things one and from one all things so couples are holes and not holes and what agrees disagrees and holes are empty and holes are holes in the ground and holes are not holes in the ground and hills are flat and hills are not flat and and a dry pen can write and a, and a pen that's dry can write and can't write and it's the same thing and water is dry and water is wet and that's bullshit so and he had a significant influence on later philosophical and religious traditions including hegel okay apples are oranges and not apples are oranges yes exactly so his philosophy violates the law of the excluded middle and the law of non-contradiction understand he utterly violates logic he violates the basic rules of logic so you go from heraclitus to hegel to marx to satanism and then to socialism in that order i'll be discussing that in the near future but that's basically the sequence now now we've got to look at this quote-unquote christian neoplatonism hello artsy fartsy you're late but moving and packing okay yeah moving is stressful so yeah glad to see you though so cardinal nicholas of cusa was a catholic theologian cardinal of the roman catholic church he was a prominent figure in the church hierarchy during the 15th century. So he was, he paid, he played a significant role in the Council of Basel, Ferrara, Florence, where he worked to reconcile the Western and Eastern churches, which didn't last, as I recall. He was a devout Catholic, and his theological and philosophical work was influenced by his Christian faith. 
So his philosophical works were influenced by quote unquote Christian Neoplatonism. It's like saying satanic Christianity. His his philosophy of Christianity was influenced by satanic Christianity. Satanic Christianity is a, is a legitimate, valid branch of Christianity based on the worship of Satan as the brother of Jesus. That's, that's exactly how stupid this is. Which refers to a philosophical and theological framework that combines Neoplatonic ideas. It's like saying, I'm going to mix some rat poison with some flour and bake a cake. It's, yeah, not a good thing. So Nicholas of Cusa, he was a very prominent figure. He employed a Christian Neoplatonic framework to develop his theological and philosophical ideas. So he integrates these concepts, such as the idea of the coincidence of opposites. In other words, pagan ideas. He takes pagan ideas that, that are just utterly illogical, that violate the basic laws of logic. Right? And he combines these with Christian teachings to explore the relationship to God, the universe, and human knowledge. So yeah, that's him. Now, oneness, the concept of oneness. This is, oneness is another problem that you, you'll hear very often People, pastors or priests will talk about the oneness theology, right? So Protestantism negates ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical authority. We know that Martin Luther and everyone negated, they, they hated Catholic authority, right? But they were happy to impose their own authority. So, and anyway, these mystics, these are religious mystics, they advocated a direct union of the soul with God. Now, the sad thing is that when you have this direct union with God, this is not Christian because we go through a mediator right we have a priest as an authority and then we have jesus as the mediator right that's when we have a church and we had jesus as a mediator but when you go well we don't need this jesus guy who the heck is that i talk to god god talks to me i'm important that means that you are now involved in a mystic in a mysticism that is pantheistic that means you can merge with god you are claiming to be a sufi basically you're doing what the sufis are doing Last I checked, Christians shouldn't be doing Muslim things, but okay if you want to. So it all comes from early thinkers not having the tools to answer the challenge posed by, posed by Parmenides. I discussed them in a previous talk, but I'm not here to talk about that today. So Plato's Parmenides is all about the one and the many. So, okay, so mysticism seeks a direct and intimate experience of the divine, that is mysticism, often transcending traditional religious structures and dogmas. It goes through all of the processes and the sacraments that we would normally use because i have a direct connection right i'm on the phone god's on the phone to me i'm special right so in this context protestantism's focus on individual spiritual spirituality and personal connection with god was a very fertile ground for mystical movements they emphasized the oneness with the divine or the universe and this idea as these ideas these mystical protestant ideas this mysticism of a direct connection with god bypassing the church bypassing jesus don't need that guy Who's that guy, right? Bypassing the priests, bypassing any authority, but having, you know, me, little old me, having a direct connection to God, this is basically pantheistic. This idea permeated the, the philosophical and theological landscape of the day. Now, Protestant mysticism is represented by Sebastian Frank, okay, Valentin Wheeler I've spoke of, and especially Mr. Burma here, J. Burma who in his book Aurora conceived the nature of God as containing in itself the energies of good and evil. And he identified the divine nature with the human soul whose operation is to kindle, according to its free will, the fire of good or the fire of evil. So, yeah, so the divine nature, okay, whatever. Reuchlin, in up to 1522, developed a system of Kabbalistic mysticism in his De Arte Kabbalistica, okay, so now you've got another mystic who's developing other things. So we were also assigned to the influence of mysticism, the ontological systems of Malebranche and the ontologists of the 18th and 19th century. So you had lots of mystical ideas and branches coming off that's from these theological and philosophical movements. Okay, so Burma. So he's a Manichaean Gnostic. Now, I've already discussed in the past how ideas that we find in Luther and in Calvin have seemingly have roots in Manichaeism, that Luther seems to have a very strong manichaeistic slant which is manichaean gnosticism right this idea of the of god having an opposite this dark this, this bad god and the good god and we will see that we find the same idea in enlightenment philosophers as well so the belief that god contains both energies of good and evil aligns with the heresy of dualism or gnosticism this is manichaean gnostic belief so dualism is a philosophy and religious belief that posits the existence of two opposing forces or principles Typically, good and evil, light and dark, or spirit and matter, right? 
In this view, opposing forces are seen as equal and independent powers of the universe. This is also going to be Heraclitus' light. So you've got these opposing forces, right? these opposites. They are equal and independent powers. So in the context of the statements about J. Burma, conceiving the nature of God as containing the energies of good and evil, this is a dualistic understanding of the divine nature where elements of both good and evil are inherent in God. But we believe as Christians, God is perfect. God is the good, right? His nature is only good, perfectly good. God is not Satan as well. Sounds like Shintoism, Kami, that God possesses both good and evil. Yes, thank you very much, Ratifati. That's interesting. So, okay, so now this contradicts traditional Christian monotheistic beliefs, right? God is purely good, pardon me, and the source of all goodness. God is not a mixture of opposing forces. So this is heretical under the view of Christian theology. So now we've got this, now we'll see that we start to develop from the time of the Reformation, not the Reformation, from the Renaissance, you've got this overflowing toilet of bad ideas that makes its way into philosophy and theology. So Manichaeism was a Gnostic religious movement founded by the Persian prophet Mani in the 3rd century. So he taught a dualistic cosmology that considered the material world and the spiritual world to be in conflict with the forces of good and evil engaged in an eternal struggle. So light and darkness, good and evil fighting each other, that's central to Manichaean theology. And Gnosticism is a lot of ancient religious ideas and systems about secret knowledge and this gnosis is the path to salvation out of this mess, right? So they often had dualistic concepts where the material world is inherently evil or corrupt, while the divine world was considered pure and good. So this, this idea of God being good and evil is a dualistic Gnostic concept. Okay, and so now we're back to the pagan idiot. Oopsie. What did I do? Sorry about that. I... Oh, bugger me. I hit the wrong button. So, so now you've got these opposing forces that are in inherent tension or harmony. Okay, so the opposites are actually in harmony. They're not, opposites are the same. Opposites are good things. So good and evil, you know, um, pedophilia and, and being married are kind of the same thing, right? Just ask Muhammad, right? So understand, so now you're back to the pagan idiot Heraclitus and his toilet of ideas. Understand, these ideas just play out through the centuries and they simply get rebranded, they get modified, but it's the same ideas over and over and over. Ah, so I read in St. Augustine's Confessions, he was disappointed at how stupid the leader of the Manichaeans was and then ceased being a Manichaean. Yeah, these are idiots. Honestly, I'm, I'm amazed that I'm actually reading this stuff and I'm finding the aspects that that I've watched a lot of discussions from, from philosophers and theologians on these philosophers and these, these you know, these... and they never spoke about the sheer lunacy and idiocy in their ideas, the bad ideas. I never heard of it. I had to go discover those myself. I had to go and learn how these people were complete fools and nut jobs and whack jobs on my own. And you're like, but you, but you realize, hold on, but they told you all the nice things. If they had told you these things about these men, you would have rejected them out of hand. You would have laughed them out of the room. You would never have had a university course on them except as calling them clowns of reason. So, 086, even in, 086 says, even in Buddhism, the gods of God-like beings can be at the same time good and evil. This is typical for most pantheistic religions. Yeah, so this is pantheism. So, yeah, this is Christian pantheism. Yeah. So, now, you had the romantic mysticism of Fichte. Someone mentioned Fichte earlier. Okay, Novalis and Schelling was a reaction against what they called the rationalism of the 18th century. So, Novalis emphasized the synthesis of reason and emotion. So, now you've got another synthesis of all heresies, right? So now they're claiming that, you know, the world has become too reasonable. In other words, our nonsense, our irrationality, our lies, our errors, our mistakes, our foolishness is being exposed by rational thinkers. People have discovered a pathway to truth and they are exposing us as the mystic idiots that we are. So now they're complaining about this. So you've got to be careful how you read this. So he wants to synthesize reason and emotion, fifis. Fifis are very important when when doing mathematics, you know, fifis, oh no, the, the, the statistics are racist and we can't have that. You know, we, we can't have racist st statistics. No. See, so he wants to synthesize reason and emotion, philosophy and poetry. You know, we need to think carefully about things, but but let's let's have a poem about the gummy bears or something. And he wants to achieve what he calls romanticization. Hello there, Barrington and uh, Mr. Rock and Dino Dennis. So, a pseudo mysticism, pantheism, is also the logical outcome of the fideism and evolutionary evolu evolutionistic 
subjectivism of modern Protestants. I know this stuff is really technical. Even I'm struggling to read it. So, uh, yeah, you can see this. Okay, so when you look at modern Protestantism, right, and when we go back to this period from the 14, 1500s up to the 1800s, what historians are saying is that what you find is a pseudo-mysticism, a form of pantheism, is the logical outcome of sola fide, because sola fide means faith alone, right? So all I need is to believe and I will merge, I will be saved, I will merge because God is speaking to me, therefore I have a direct connection with God. That's pantheism. So therefore, this is subjectivist it is, and it's also pantheistic. So now you've got, you've got scholars writing about this stuff, right? Seeing these things, but of course they don't talk about it because that would offend too many Protestants. So now you've got, they speak of Lessing, Schleiermacher. I've spoken about Schleiermacher earlier in this talk. Okay. And they speak of and accepted by the modernists in their theories of vital imminence and religious experience. This idea of vital imminence, this is something we see with the Puritans. We see it with the Mormons. We see it with the Seventh-day Adventists. We see it with the, with Marx. Sorry. Yeah. With, we see it with Hegel. We see it with um, um, Luther. We see it with Calvin. You see this in so I've spoken about this before, the burning in the bosom and all of that. This idea of vital imminence, that God is present and he's connected to you. You're connected to him. It's like that's pantheism, that he's pagan, right? So now this mystical tradition within Protestantism is a departure from traditional rational approaches. It emphasizes a direct union of the soul with God leading to a mystical and pantheistic outlook. So while some Protestant traditions have rejected mysticism, others like the Quakers have embraced mystical practices. Okay, now while certain Protestant traditions may have rejected direct mysticism, you'll discover that mysticism is still very much part and parcel of their belief system. It's not based on ration rationality, it's, it's genuinely based on mysticism, but it doesn't claim to be, it tends not to be. So the presence of mysticism amongst various cultures means that it is rooted in human nature. This is part and parcel of our nature to want to commune with God. The soul has a longing and striving for ultimate and absolute truth, and also it wants to find the highest form of goodness. So we realize that seeking knowledge and joy from just worldly things, just possessions, doesn't provide complete spiritual satisfaction. So therefore you're looking for something spiritual, but now instead of going through authority of the church, you decide, you know what, I'm going to do this myself, and how do you know you're talking to God? Well, you test the spirits, right? And you go... Um, I'll use the prosperity gospel and God gave me a thousand dollars I won in the lottery. So must have been God, right? How do you know for a fact that you're not talking, communing to some kind of evil entity? So erroneous philosophy. So I'll do, I'll, I'll probably finish soon ish. Okay. Welcome villainous. <clears throat> so there is in our soul, a capacity for more truths and perfection than we can ever acquire through the knowledge of created things. We realize that God alone is the end of man, that in the possession of God alone, we can reach the satisfaction of our aspirations. That is St. Thomas Aquinas in Summa Theologia, right? Or Summa Theologica. And he says, our human intelligence and will may reach their boundaries when trying to comprehend a deeper connection with God beyond what is found in the physical world. Is it possible to have a closer relationship with God than what we achieve through our understanding of the world? We cannot be sure if we can attain a knowledge of God beyond analogies and a happiness that matches understanding. Our limited human reason cannot provide a definitive answer to these questions. So when reason failed to provide answers, okay, so that is the, sorry, who wrote that? Hold on. I may have made a small mistake. Let me double check that I have the right. Um... Give me a second. I, I need to figure out who said that because... Um... Okay, now I think that was Thomas Aquinas, right? So now reason failed to provide. So what happens is people wanted to commune with God. They wanted to become connected with God, right? So reason couldn't take them there. So philosophers turned to emotions and imagination. So because, now here's the thing. Remember we said earlier that we are not meant to have <clears throat> heaven on earth. We are told that this is, the kingdom of God is not on earth. This this world belongs to satan at the end of the day so we are in the world but not of the world so while we participate in the world and we can see good in the world we also have to acknowledge evil in the world but what happened is they wanted to say look i don't want to be limited i want to know god and therefore i'm going to utilize magic i'm going to utilize 
I'm going to insist that I am connected to God. So they turned to emotions and imagination. They made things up. So they envisioned a mystical connection with God through direct contemplation and possession. Now that's fascinating though, that they use the word possession, seeking unity with the universe and human nature. So philosophical systems were constructed with the world and human soul were seen as emanations of or having elements of the divine essence. Now we're back to Gnosticism. So the human soul is an emanation of Albert, the monad. What is elements of the divine essence? Again, you're talking about Gnosticism. So this leads to the development of pantheism. So if you can commune with God, that means you are the same substance of God as God. You are not, according to Christian doctrine, of the same substance as God. So, however, this conclusion is a clear indication of initial errors in their beliefs. Okay, so let's continue. So now let's look at what the Catholic Church teaches. So in its role as protector of Christian teachings, the Roman Catholic Church provided an answer through its theologians and teachings. It acknowledged the limitations of human reason, but while the human soul has potential to understand and follow God, it does not inherently possess the ability to fully reach God except through analogy-based knowledge. The Church has condemned the immediate vision of the Burgards and the Bagains, okay? the pseudo-mysticism of Eckhart and Molinus, the theories of the ontologists, and pantheism under all its forms, as well as the vital imminence and religious experience of the modernists. So, vital imminence, the belief that God is present and active within creation. So in modernism, the concept of spontaneous internal action or a vital force within humans that drives religious experience, in other words, feelings. It is not typically seen as a feeling inside, but a dynamic internal energy or impulse that influences religious belief and practice. At the end of the day, it's Fifi's. Oh, let me just go back here. So, so the church says this is now this is the view of the catholic church there are things beyond human understanding which are known through revelation and faith through the grace of god humans can achieve what is beyond their natural abilities god has elevated human nature to a supernatural level and has set the ultimate goal as the direct vision of himself known as the beatific vision don't forget, these people are trying to claim that they can merge with God. Again, that's the whole Muslim pantheistic view. But this end, and the Gnostic view, but this end can be reached only in the next life. In the present life, we can but prepare ourselves for it with the aid of revelation and grace. To some souls, God gives a special grace by which they are unable to feel his presence, a true mystical contemplation. In this act, there is no annihilation or absorption of the creature into God but God becomes intimately present to the created mind. Now, it's interesting that absorption is pantheistic, but also Gnostic, whereas annihilation is Sufi, right? So this is the Muslim approach, the annihilation. So you're, you, are, you as, a, as a personality are annihilated and you enter into your true self, which is to merge with Allah. You become Allah. You are Allah at the end of the day. You are God. It's weird how the Sufis have that view so that you actually become God. Right? Remember, Allah has 99 names, right? 99 secret names. That, or no, rather, Allah has 99 names, but he's got multiple sets of 99 names. He's probably got like 500 names, but Allah has one secret name. You don't know what that secret name is, but according to one Sufi who was killed for re apparently revealing too much, that secret name of Allah is you. You are Allah. You see? You are God. You merge with Allah. You become Allah. So, and therefore, you are annihilated and you eventually join Allah with Allah. So so that's the whole weird Sufi philosophy there. So Dr. Obvious says, it seems to me the greatest error of these philosophers is the fundamental lack of comprehension that God is the creator and everything else is a created being. Yes, that is true. Modernism is anti-God. Yes. Uh, okay, so guys, let's let's dump the whole Palmenides discussion. Let's do that for later. Um, so <laughs> yeah, everyone missed the part where God created Adam from the dust. Yes. Uh, so mind and reason have limit. Yes, spirit and soul do not have limit to know God. Well, they say human spirit still has limits in terms of knowing God. Okay. <clears throat> so that sounds like nirvana, leaving behind yourself and diffusing in the God-like state. Exactly. It is not. It is pantheistic. It is pagan. So the new age is all about being gods. Correct. All of this stuff is just manifestations of the same ideas over and over. So now we speak of the devotio moderna. This means modern devotion. Now Britannica says the group there was a group called the Devotio Moderna. 
They stressed meditation and the inner life, attaching little importance to ritual and external works and downgrading what they called the speculative spirituality of the 13th and 14th centuries. So they said, look, through meditation and by us just, you know, we'll just pray and talk to God directly. I don't need a priest. I don't need a church. I don't need the Bible. And that Jesus guy, yeah, he can go away. Okay, because we, we talk straight to God, you know, me and God, he my boy, right? That's apparently their idea. So, but a guy called Geert Grutte died 1384. He's the founder of the movement. So he apparently was a former self-indulgent man, self-indulgent man who repented his life. So he became an, he became a preacher and monk. He gathered a community around him. Hold on. Oh, sorry, my bad. So the devotion on there. Let let me do the clean one. Sorry, I, sh I should have deleted the slide because I summarized it elsewhere. The devotion moderna or modern devotion. These guys are a movement within Catholicism at the end of the 14th through 16th century. They stressed meditation and inner spirituality. They downplayed ritualistic practices and external works. So these guys are not Catholics. They're within the Catholic Church, but I'd say their, their, their theology is questionable. Moderna, drug company. Yeah, interesting. Moderna, exactly. Geert Grutte was a repentant, formerly self-indulgent man who became a preacher and monk. He gathered a community around him without using vows. There was no sort of vows. Just like, yeah, let's all get together and let's, let's be a bunch of hippies and be nice to each other. He believed that religion is to love God and worshiping him, not the taking of special vows. So as long as you love God, you're a Christian. That's it. Just love God. What does that mean? Because age is nothing but a number. And I, you know, maybe Muhammad loved himself a little child. So is that Christian? I don't know. Followers gathered in defended Netherlands, known as the Brethren of the Common Life. They were not bound by vows, but they lived in monastic simplicity. The movement eventually became part of the canons regular of St. Augustine. Approved by the Pope in 1395, they produced books and they became educators. Numerous notable Catholics were educated by them, including Desiderius Erasmus. Thomas Akempis wrote the famous book, The Imitation of Christ, considered one of the most beloved books in history. And it is linked to the Devotio Moderna movement, which sought to make religion more accessible and relevant to the evolving beliefs of the late 14th century in the Netherlands. So now you've got, well, religion has to evolve to keep pace with the modern times like maybe gay marriage should be allowed and maybe we got to bless gays or whatever the case might be i'm not making a comment here on on the whole fiducia supplicant story but but understand so this may or may not be a good thing right now so these guys start off a little weird and then they become christianized well they, they get absorbed into the catholic church as a legitimate thing but maybe there's still some oddities about them okay so now, let's take a look at the Morning Star. So in the Mystics, we have a helpful introduction to one part of the reform that was needed in the church, a renewed attention to the inner life with God. But this didn't go far enough. Without a corresponding renewal of the outer, objective truth of salvation, which by now had been buried under layers of pagan idolatry, superstition, and sophistry, the church at this time still had room for its mystics, but it did not have room for the reformers of the outer truth. Such were Wycliffe and Hus, to whom we turn next week. This is a lecture. This is a talk given on history, on Protestant history. And this guy is going, Wycliffe and Hus are just amazing. And we have mystics in the church, you know, Protestant mystics that are just amazing. Yeah, we've discovered that the main Protestant mystics were complete heretics and just completely off the rails, but okay. But he says, so we've got our heretics that are, um, you know, doing good things here in the church, but... But we need to reform the outer aspects of the of the church, right? And Wycliffe and Hus. Now, Wycliffe, just so you know, okay. Wycliffe changed James, okay. So, so Wycliffe and James. Sorry, I missed a typo here. The book of James in the Bible in the New Testament is originally the book of Jacob. Mister Wycliffe came along. Now you'll see all sorts of wonderful stories about how Wycliffe translated the Bible and did a great. Wycliffe was, was writing his own Bible, running off on his own ideas. He took the book of James and uh, he changed the name. So he took the book of Jacob and he renamed it to the book of James, confusing everything because he wanted to separate this book. He wanted to separate the New Testament and Jesus's family, Jesus' Jesus's lineage from the Jews. He wanted to create an artificial separation. He wanted to do, and so the name of James stuck in the English. So he wanted to de-Jewify the New Testament, and Jesus' lineage, right? I discussed that at length in James or Jacob in the Bible, the book of Jacob. It, it is, correctly, the book of Jacob. Yeah, so John Wycliffe was an inspiration to Martin Luther. Wycliffe is sometimes called the morning star of the Reformation. 
which is odd. Okay, the term is phosphoros, right? And this is considered to be one of the most prominent because he's considered a prominent contributor to Luther's Reformation. Now, the Morning Star, let's have a look at what is this phosphorus. Let's, let's have a look at that. Let's have a brief look at phosphorus. Okay. So, phosphorus is light bringing, giving light. Okay. It is the planet Venus, the Morning Star, the Day Star, but also refers to Satan. It's also a metaphor for Christ. So, I'm not sure exactly how this is referred to because also it's Lucifer. Okay. The planet Venus. These are, this is, I'm not sure why Luther and others felt they needed to call him the morning star of the Reformation. I find the imagery really, really odd. But State, why did you deserve a ban? Because this is not the time for you to spout on about off-topic discussions. Okay. Okay, so you can have your discussion. You can arrange to have your discussion with whoever it is another time not here not now it is too distracting do it again i will ban you so now wycliffe rejected traditional authority he claimed the bible had more authority than priest or pope and of course that's his interpretation of the bible had more authority he's in other words he has more authority than priest or pope because he's going to interpret the bible according to his personal subjective opinion so editing the bible as we know is okay when Protestants do it, because Wycliffe edited the Bible, in one, in, he actually changed the name of one book for very pernicious reasons. Now, we know that the Bible is perfect. We know that Sola Scriptura teaches us that the Bible is perfect, and we only need the Bible, And um, except the Bible needs a few changes, and the Protestants are going to make some changes. They're going to edit a few books, throw out a few books. They're going to make a few word changes here and there, because the Bible's not so good. But once we make a few changes, it's going to be perfect because the Bible's perfect and pure and should never be altered. The Bible's never been altered. It's perfectly preserved, except Protestants are going to have to make a few serious edits and remove several books, and they're going to have to change a few words. Okay, And the Protestants are the ones to improve the Bible by making changes, and it's okay if Wycliffe changed the Bible because he's not a Catholic, and we hate the Catholics, and therefore it's okay no matter what Wycliffe does, even if he alters the Bible, changes the Bible, changes the meaning, makes edits, that's okay. Wycliffe did. And Wycliffe was, was killed because he changed. No, Wycliffe was a complete heretic and he made, he was doing his own thing. And um, the Catholic Church had had plenty of translations of the Bible. We didn't need Wycliffe's Bible. So, yeah, rules for me, not for thee. Okay. So, then you had the Peasants' Revolt. I'll pause in five minutes. So, you had the Peasants' Revolt in 1381 in England. There was social unrest. By that period, it was one of social unrest. And this was preceded by other turbulence, right? There were such as the Babylonian captivity, as they call it, and the Great Schism in the church. So the Babylonian ca captivity is from 1309 to 1377. So the popes are residing in Avenue of France instead of Rome. Then you had the Great Schism. There's a division in the church. You had rival popes in Avignon and in Rome. And so many began to question the church leadership, and they wanted a more direct connection with God. They saw the church was unstable. They didn't know who to follow. So they separated themselves from the church and they would start to find, okay, look, I need to find God myself. So this allowed all of these crazy heresies to start to grow, these crazy philosophies to start to, to build. So two types of mystics emerged, the Latin mystics and the Teutonic mystics. The Latin mystics placed emphasis on mysticism as a personal and emotional experience of God, of Christ. Now, one of the most famous is Bernard of Clairvaux, 12th century. He advocated for a unity of will with God. Individuals align their desires with God's will. In other words, thy will be done. He wanted a unity of affection with the love for God and a sincere and undivided heart. Okay. So he basically talks of the marriage, okay, with God as the bridegroom and the soul as the bride, taken from the Song of Songs. That's his concept of Christian mysticism. He's a well known Catholic. Right? Now Teutonic, now we're back to the Germans, right? Teutonic means of or pertaining to the Germanic languages and to peoples or tribes who speak or spoke them. So the Teutonic mystics, these German mystics, um, had a very different focus. They wanted a spiritual union with the essence of God. Now remember, we are not of the essence of God. You have the Trinity. You've got God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit of one essence, three different persons. You as a creature are not of the essence of God. Therefore, you cannot merge with God. You're not one with God. But they believed that they could merge with, again, pantheism. Either they had to demote God or they have to promote themselves to the level of God. 
So this pursuit led some to adopt pantheistic beliefs. So Germany was swimming in this kind of weird heresy. That's where Luther came from. That's where all of these weird German theologians came from. All these weird German philosophers were swimming in this weird heresy. So this is where the concept emerged that God is synonymous with his creation. So Catherine of Siena exemplified the pinnacle of Latin mysticism, believing that she received divine messages through visions which she used to enact practical outcomes. So she confronts clerical corruption and she persuades Gregory XI to return to Rome. And she stands against sin within the papacy. On the other hand, you get Meister Eckhart, the Teutonic strand. And so he comes from a very different perspective. He advocates the belief that only God exists. And you see, if, if only God exists, then you are God. You're at least of the same essence of God. So he taught that spiritual fulfillment for Christians is achieved through a profound merging of human and divine essence during moments of ecstatic connection, which is a Sufi belief. Understand, this is 100% Muslim. So despite facing accusations of pantheism and condemnation, Meister Eckhart, his influence endures, and he inspires a group of Dominican Catholic priests known as the Friends of God who continued to embrace his teachings. So in other words, you've now got the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church now has this heresy, this strand inside the church. And this is something that, that we've got to ask ourselves, is it still there? When was it eradicated? But the problem is that every theological tradition has always had heresy inside it, has always had people trying to undermine it, people within it, and who are trying to mix rat poison and water, and the two do not mix very well. So the only merging of humanity and divinity is manifested in Jesus Christ only. Yes, Dr. Obvious. So yeah, guys, this is very technical. It's very detailed. I know, I hope I'm not, I'm doing this thing justice. Um, it's a lot of dense history. It's a lot of dense philosophy. It's very hard for me to summarize this, but hopefully you're starting to understand that this is not a simple problem, but we can see there's, there's a certain heresy that, that, that has been around for hundreds, hundreds of years. Now, let's go back to Johann Paulo. This is the guy I was trying to rem remember earlier. When you speak to the Catholic Church, you look at their records, they say, no, Paulo was legit, 100%, fantastic, great Catholic. But when you read his works, when you read some other histories of him, you start to go, you, you know what, Paulo, there's something about Paulo. It's like when you get told about Wickham, right, Occam, sorry, when you get told about Occam, you go like, Occam's fantastic. And then you read Occam and you realize this guy is not Christian. The guy's maybe an atheist, maybe some kind of weird heretic, but not a Christian. You come to Tauler and you just keep getting this information that Tauler is not on the level. There's something weirder. So let's finish on this slide. Thank you very much, Neil. Thank you very much. He says, your work is unique. And he says, and Sahuayo, I hope I said that right. A small error at the beginning becomes a huge one in the end. Yeah, the yeah. error of parallax. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so let's finish on Tauler. Tauler, again, again, because we keep coming back to Johann Tauler. So Johann Tauler, 1300 to 1361, he diverges from Eckhart. He puts emphasis on evangelical principles and experiencing God inwardly. Okay, fine and well. But he stresses that internal spiritual connection held more value for the soul's well-being than mere external rituals. Hold on, we've just had heretics, obvious, blatant, flaming pagan heretics say exactly the same thing. This guy's a Catholic. This guy's supposed to be a legit, on-level, good Catholic, saying exactly what the heretics are saying. So it's heresy when they do it, but it's not heresy when he does it. This doesn't make sense. Belinda says, seems to me heresies of a basis of pride are no more than God. So I will, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I'll tell him what he is like. Exactly. God's just like me. Yeah, exactly. That, that's that's a very good point. Good work exposing Tyler. Thank you, Dr. Jonathan Gamble. Yeah, this is a tough one. It's I don't know what to think about this guy. It's really, I mean, what am I supposed to make of this dude? Um, a saying from Spain, you can build a cathedral on one side of the street, the devil will pop up his tents on the other side, for sure. So, okay, so moving on now. So the influential work, Theologia Germanica, which again influenced Martin Luther heavily, is believed to have originated from a group of mystics influenced by Tauler's teachings. So hold on, now you've got Martin Luther who's taking ideas from this book that are clearly erroneous and heretical, and this book is derived from teachings based on Tauler. So this book has a profound impact on Martin Luther, right? Martin Luther is looking for salvation and he finds it here. So he found his own lightning had parts of it published in German and he released it in full in 1518 with a preface saying that this book had extraordinary value in furthering his understanding of God, Christ, humanity, and existence. So these mystics played a huge role in Luther's spiritual journey. 
So they guide him supposedly towards a profound knowledge of Christ. But hold on, we've just as learned that these particular mystics are off their rockers. These mystics are not grounded in reality. They have pantheistic ideas. They have very Sufi ideas. They have non-Christian ideas, right? So another group of mystics is known as the Brethren of the Common Life, and the Brethren of the Common Life, and based in the Netherlands, offered a more practical approach. They try to distinguish themselves from the friends of God by steering clear of pantheistic beliefs. They were very pragmatic, okay, and they're best remembered for their contribution to the creation of the renowned book, The Imitation of Christ by Thomas a. Kempis, who was known at that time as Thomas Hemerken of Kempen. Yeah, now I, I have not looked into Thomas a. Kempis. Someone mentioned him earlier. So I have no idea if the guy's legit or not. But yeah, so while mystical union with God was a central goal for many mystics, including those influenced by Towler and the Brethren of the Common Life, there were concerns about potential pantheistic tendencies arising from what is noted as an excessive blurring of boundaries between the created world and the divine world. The mystics forgot the distinction between the creator and the creation. So the overwhelming theme, I'll end here, but the overwhelming theme here is that you've got these mystics who forget that they are in the created world. They are creatures. They are not the divine. They're not the creator. But they believe that they are connected to the creator. And the mystics thus forget the distinction. They think they are God. This is pantheism. This is Gnosticism. This is a number of heresies. None of this is Christian. But you've got mystics that overwhelmingly negatively misrepresent christianity they basically become gnostics they become atheists at the end of the day they, they become pantheists they become anything but christian so hopefully so hopefully i've done a good job this was really complex i had to go through a lot of history on this but understand mysticism i mean again um saint anselm pius x speaks a lot about saint anselm and anselm had huge issues with mystics in the catholic church so you've got lots of issues in all the churches, right? But the Catholic Church has a certain set of doctrine that is known from the beginning. And I will be talking about that again. I'll be doing other talks on that topic. So hopefully this has given you something to, to, to understand, well, given you some greater understanding. The, this is a fight that's been going on for centuries. You've got mystics. Now, again, all of this links up, all of this Protestant and Catholic theology and bad theology links up with Hegel, with Marx. We can trace it straight to Satanism. We're going to do that. We can trace it into all of the worst theologies and philosophies that we know of the last thousand years. So it is all insane. Dr. Obvious says, never would I have heard of all these fuzzy thinkers of such great influence with not Floyd's history lessons. Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, hopefully I didn't butcher this too much. I'm, I'm pretty exhausted. The last two weeks have been crazy. Um, I've really had an insane couple of weeks. It's been, it's been really heavy. Uh, things are calming down. Um, so I'll try and do something on Thursday. And I've got family coming for a few days, um, so they'll leave on Sunday. But I've got um, Thunderous on Sunday. We were supposed to do this Sunday, but he canceled, so we've moved it one week. So thanks, guys. Yeah, sorry if I butchered a lot of the pronunciations, but I'm actually quite tired today. But yeah, hopefully you've learned something. I mean, I didn't know about this, but again, you'll see all of these things are connected. None of these ideas are disconnected. All of these things are... And you'll find they basically take pagan ideas, they take heresies, they take all sorts of crazy Gnosticism... And they clothe it in Christian language. They make it look Christian. And we're going to see from the philosophical point of view how philosophy merges with theology or how the two sort of, well, work together. You'll find that, again, these, these pagan ideas, these Gnostic ideas, these heresies, they clothe themselves, they clothe themselves in modern scientific language, modern theological language, and they try to present themselves as Christian. And they're anything but. But once you trace them back to their root, where they come from, you see that, that these people are insane. So... Yeah, so look, we, so Thunderous Cancel, what a slacker. Yeah, I didn't know. He called me at the last, like an hour before. So I had to cancel and then do a different talk. So, but that's okay. So guys, I have eight more slides on this one. Okay. I have eight more slides and um, I will cover those, the Protestant Revolution. And we'll discuss a little bit of why the Protestant Reformation was not a reformation. It was a revolution. It was an emancipation from authority. It was an emancipation from, from authority and structure. Basically the privatization of religion and the privatization of salvation, the privatization of communion with God. I can do what the heck I want. And we're going to see some of that. So we'll be discussing that. So I've got eight more slides or seven more slides on this. And then I'll do some other things. So yeah, guys, um, thank you very much. Good to see you all. And um, 
Thanks, sir. So we shall see you. The Netherlands had a particularly nasty form of Calvinism. Yes, yes, yes. There's Volt Veritatum says, yeah, Netherlands, there's some issues in the Netherlands, especially when we get into the the um, the, the Spanish Inquisition. Then you start to find the Netherlands plays a big role in, in, in yeah, the Netherlands, not good. So checked with our trad nun about Kempis and she said the imitation of Christ is second in books else of the Bible. She called it exemplary. Yeah. Whatever. I have no, I know nothing about it. So reformation is shifting authority. Yeah. Well, it's privatization of authority, a privatization of, of salvation, a privatization of religion, private religion. Christianity has always been a public um, theology, not a private theology. So Thanks, Dr. Jonathan Gimmel. He says, thank you. Great show. I've learned a lot from your shows. So what about the Snake Atlas Church? And <laughs> whatever weirdness. So yeah, guys, thank you. Hopefully that's been interesting and educational. Let's call it a night. And I will see you guys in a couple of days. And thank you and God bless.